liar. Everywhere. On NetRootsRadio.com. David Waldman. Kagra. In the morning. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How are you doing? It is Monday, October 17th, 2022. Time for a whole week of shows. Uh, well, at least uh, most of the week of shows. Uh, the housekeeping news for today. A small uh, break in the action for a long weekend that nobody else has scheduled as a long weekend. we got to see if we can come up with some sort of holiday excuse for doing this. There isn't one. It's just time to take one. We're going to take a long weekend that will keep us off the air this Friday and next Monday. So I'm already worrying Greg about this because, of course, this is the big release for all the weekend news for Greg. And he'll just have to uh, I'll give him a tin can with a string tied to it and I'll take it with me. Uh, another one like it. And we'll we'll pretend we're having a show. But uh, all right, you know, then we'll uh, schedule a big uh, catch up session for next Wednesday. But uh, break needed break being taken we'll see what we can do to keep you company during that time we might be able to hammer out one thing to keep you going that's all new but uh, i don't know things are busy this week i got meetings in between now and the time it's time to leave it's um many things many things are happening many people are saying i shouldn't make a show some people say this so anyway Lots to catch up on, of course, for this weekend. Greg already getting ready to do that. We'll get through the raft o stories. That'll probably carry us through the balance of the week anyway as we continue to discuss these things and they continue to develop. In this morning's news, oh, I don't know. There were lots of uh, Trump legal developments on Friday and over the weekend and new stories coming out. I guess people are writing new books or excerpting their ones that are coming out now. And telling us things that we should have known four or five years ago, but many of us actually probably had guessed them if we didn't outright know them four or five years ago. Anyway, um, more news on the, I don't know what kind of front would you call it. I, I see today that in addition to, uh, what's his name, uh, Elon Musk getting ready once again to say, anyhow, that he is going to buy Twitter because... I don't know what. He was upset with something and the way they were restricting his totally free speech or whatever. So he's going to buy Twitter and take it over and uh, remake it in his own image. Similarly, Kanye West, and who now has had his uh, his account, I guess, uh, locked by Twitter and it was temporarily banned and had to remove his anti-Semitic tweets. He's looking for a New forum where he can be anti-Semitic freely and or, and or spend millions of dollars or I guess billions of dollars because that's what these things cost these days. Inflation has really jacked up the price of buying your own social media platform. He says he's going to buy Parler, the one that was originally built by right-wingers at some point because they were upset that they couldn't be anti-Semitic on Twitter or whatever particular infraction it was at the time pretty good bet that it was, you know, anti-Semitism or verging on it anyway. Uh, but Kanye West says he'll buy right-wing social platform Parler, according to the company anyway. I don't know whether Kanye West has actually said anything about it. I don't know how that sort of PR stuff works. But I guess this is the new pay-per-tweet model that Elon Musk was thinking of. But if you're a billionaire or thereabouts, then I guess paying per tweet is you, you write a tweet that's terrible. Twitter kicks you off. And you pay for it by buying a social media platform, whether it be Twitter or some other one, and saying, from now on, I'll be allowed to be anti-Semitic or upside down and backwards or lie about uh, vaccines or whatever because I own the place. And then I don't know what happens after that. So, OK, that's the plan. Um, and who knows whether it really comes to fruition? Who knows whether the one Elon Musk keeps on again, off again, announcing is ever going to come to fruition or whether it's all just a big bluff to try and force the one that they're working on now, Twitter, to do what they want. So, OK, we'll see. I mean, it's entirely possible. It appears from all reports that Kanye West is mm, 
you know, having men- mental episodes with greater frequency these days. So, and I don't know whether, I, I actually, I don't know whether that's evidence of his real intent to buy parlor or not. It's kind of a crazy thing. So maybe it won't happen because it sounds kind of crazy. On the other hand, because it sounds so crazy, it might really be Kanye West's plan. So who knows? It'll make no difference to me. Um, I'm not certain that Elon Musk buying Twitter ends up making a difference or not because, you know, he still wants to make money with it, I assume. And that probably means uh, allowing people pretty much to do whatever it is that they want. But I guess we'll have to do it among a larger volume of garbage. Uh, Parler will definitely make no difference to me. I'm not there and I never plan to be there. So, okay. Speaking of technological acquisitions. That was a big story for the weekend, and I haven't yet seen whether it is in the raft of stories, but I'm sure we'll touch on it and perhaps spend a little extra time on it uh, after bringing it to your attention, because it's uh, an intricate and entertaining story. But uh, apparently over in right, where we're one of the uh, one of the startups that Trump has got uh, to, uh, well, I think that, the oh, yes, right. It is Truth Social, the one he started, uh, well, no, the one he became associated with, according to the story anyway, uh, as a replacement for Twitter. They still haven't let him on there, and I think that was Elon Musk's big thing. Well, I'll let uh, Donald Trump back on Twitter because it's so good for business. Anyway, as it turns out, maybe he thinks twice about it because of this rather lengthy article explaining just how difficult it is to be in business with Donald Trump. And that's um, one, because he's a he's personally odious and no one wants to have anything to do with him. Two, because he's spectacularly famous for his incredible greed. And three, because he just doesn't really understand how to actually run a business. And when he has anything to do with the running of a business, he ruins it. So I don't know. Maybe it's something that uh, Elon Musk wants to think about. The big backstory in this was uh, that uh, to the limited ex- limited extent that there's been any success whatsoever at Truth Social, Trump stands poised to ruin it by robbing the company and stripping it bare of all of its assets and splitting it up among his family. And that's not the way things normally work when you're trying to make a go of a business. But he's insisting on it anyway. So. More details to come, but you've probably, you know, at least become aware of that story. And if not, why, we'll share all the details later on. Greg Dworkin is here with another raft of stories. That one, I'm sure, is among them. Good morning, Greg. How are you? Good morning. So uh, I don't understand why Elon Musk simply doesn't buy the United Kingdom. That's probably like on really sale now. now. Yeah, you're right. Uh, there's the, their if revenues you're really are way a business, down. Man, if you really had the business acumen that he claims, hmm. just do that. You know, he's good at renovating, and if he's good right. at renovating, why doesn't he buy Russia and fix it? That's a good question. I don't even know why he has to pay. I think he can just somehow turn on Starlink, whatever that means. I just see it said a lot, and uh, then I think he takes over. Yeah, you know, I'm not even positive he has to pay a dime. In uh, in United States, you know, you pay to buy things. In Russia, they pay you. <laughs> I, I'm something like that, I guess, right? It's the opposite of whatever you're used to. So I, I don't know. But uh, a lot of odd things going on. We'll talk about politics a little bit. You know, there's always uh, politics to talk about. Oh, yeah. But uh, I want to uh, start. We started with England. Why don't we finish uh, what's going on there? I want to give you a flavor of just how much Liz Truss's uh, support, mm-hmm. trust, if you will, has tanked. Oh, okay. Trust has trust. Trust, is, trust, uh, trust has tr- tanked. Ranks. Okay. Um, and and nobody likes her. And I have to remind people, and thank goodness we covered it on the show, so it's not completely new. How she got there. Yes. Boris Johnson was a failure, right? Partly okay. because of COVID, partly because of his personality. And partly because of Brexit, the thing that they don't want to touch. Hmm. And the Brexit failure underlies everything that's going on. And it's making things more expensive and it's uh, worsening every possible economic uh, situation that's, uh, you know, made possible by the war and the energy prices and everything else. So Johnson gets booted out. 
And uh, like in this country, the different parties had different rules for leadership. And in the Tory party, in the conservative party, the leadership is decided by no confidence votes, which kick out the old person, whoever was uh, uh, prime minister before, and then bring in the new person. And the way that the new person is selected is first, it goes through a series of uh, IRV votes, uh, which we're very used to now in Maine and, yeah. and uh, Alaska. And the members of parliament, the MPs, are the ones who participate in this. So the MPs pick the PM, that is to say the new prime minister, who governs within their party because it's not an election, general election. It's simply party leadership changing. Yes. Okay. So they have this rule that says that after the no confidence vote, which, by the way, you're only allowed to do once a year according to their rules. Oh, uh, they then uh, will decide who to offer the membership at large, not just members of parliament, but membership of large of the Tory party. You have to have been a party member uh, for three months prior to this. So in effect, it's it's uh, like a, a party primary. So yes, the top two people that the MPs picked go to the party primary and the party members decide who is going to be leader. And because it's the Tories in power and they're only selecting whoever the Tory leader is, it doesn't go to the general electorate. Right, okay. And so uh, the members of parliament picked a uh, middle-of-the-road conservative who is uh, supposedly good with finances, uh, Rishi Sunak, but the membership rejected this backroom deal. Oh, my. And they decided that they wanted to go with Liz Truss. So that means the members of parliament never really wanted her anyway. Hmm. Not that there's any resentment and not that ever comes up in human nature. <laughs> okay. okay. So the, the general membership doesn't like the conservative money guy. He's a little bit too staid and they want a fighter. So they go with Liz Truss and Liz Truss. Uh, says, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to lower taxes on the rich. Sounds and, uh, so far. you know, people will love this. And it's basically uh, Reaganomics. It's Laffer Curve stuff. Mm. It's trickle down economics. And the markets will love it. And, of course, uh, because of the, the uh, uh, Russia Ukrainian war right now, energy is at a premium. And Brexit has made everything more expensive. Inflation is rampant. And so all of this borrowing, which has to be done because you can't pay for tax cuts, not yeah. initially according to them and not ever according to normal people. Right. Uh, the markets hated it and they tanked. And so within a couple of days, they're saying, I'll never change my mind on this. You changed your mind on this and rescinded the tax cuts on the rich. And when that wasn't enough and people were still upset, she fired her staunch closest ally, the oh. chancellor of the exchequer, who had come up with this scheme with her and said, oh, it's all bad his scheme. fault. Bad scheme. OK. And so now she's in the situation where the public hates her. Her own party members didn't like her, uh, the members of parliament to begin with. And they're the mm. ones that initiate leadership changes because she wasn't her first choice. And now with the liberals leading by 30 some odd points in the polls, and them thinking they're going to get wiped out, which is probably true, they've turned on her. And so in this conservative uh, uh, publication, The Spectator, I, I want to give you a, a sample of the headlines over the last few days. Fraser Nelson writing, why Liz Truss failed. Patrick O'Flynn writing, the spectacular fall of Liz Truss, the PM makes Theresa May look like a slick operator. <laughs> okay. The Spectator, Isabel Oakshot, the plot to put... Rishi Sunak at number 10. Remember, that's the guy that the MPs wanted initially. Now, was, uh, I, I'm trying to remember the way you said, I remember you mentioned him. Is, was he the choice of the rank and file or the choice of the no, party No, he was leadership. the choice of the MPs. The, the leader. And the rank and file rejected that choice and went with trust. I see. Okay. So the MP said, let's go back to our original choice. Let's get rid of her. I see. All right. And let's put the guy, we told you, you should have listened to us and you didn't. And let's put him in because he'll calm the markets. 
Hmm. The problem with that, of course, is they have this rule uh, <laughs> by their 1922 committee that says you can only do a no confidence vote once a year. That's amazing. So you either have to persuade Liz Trust to quit or you have to change the rules. They did well, not think that through that rule. I, I I was wondering whether they would decide, oh, well, you can only do it once a year against a particular, you know, prime minister. And well, then they're out. change so. prime ministers, right. No, you no, know, no. You can only do it once a year according funny. to the rules. Yeah, that's so a lot of confidence. So they're going to have to change the rules. And can they change the rules? Of course they can. Whoever right. has the gavel has the opportunity and the majority in that committee has the opportunity to change rules because it's a rule, but only as long as the rule stands. Mm-hmm. Yes. I mean, okay. That's, uh, there are technicalities there and there are subtleties there in our parliament as well as their Senate and House or vice versa. But the fact of the matter is, if you don't like the rules, you can change the rules if you have the votes. OK. Right. Is the parliamentarian uh, always to be listened to? Depends whether you have the votes or not. I guess that's true. We could swap parliamentarians. You could swap parliamentarians. You can do whatever you want. You, want you, ours? you have the votes. And the reason that the Democrats are in the... Uh, a 50-50 pickle they're in right now is they can't get everything done that they want because they don't have the votes. Yeah. So uh, it, it turns out that because Liz Truss isn't that popular among the MPs to begin with, they have the votes. Hmm. Okay. Should so be exciting. Steer Pike, who goes, I don't know what his real name is, but that's what he goes by in The oh. Spectator also. Why The Spectator? Because, yeah, there's some liberal commentary too. It's important. You could read The Guardian. You could, you could read Ian Dunt and some of the liberals. But the fact of the matter is that when the conservatives turn on trust, it's telling you a lot more than when the liberals turn on trust. Because that was going to be true like five seconds after she was uh, appointed. All right. So Steerpike writes in The Spectator, watch, first Tory MP calls for trust to go. So they were saying this uh, behind the scenes. Now they're saying it outright. And you have to remember, she's only been there a month. Uh, I didn't even feel like it was that long. Uh, yeah, it feels like a couple of days, but, uh, you know, September 5th was the election right. and then it took a couple of more weeks for her to actually be, uh, you know, appointed. Ah. That was the last visited with the late queen Elizabeth. Hmm. Then we had to go through the Elizabeth funeral, right? Everything stopped, everything stopped. And so it feels like a couple of days, but actually it's been a month. So a month is a long time and a month isn't that long at all. It's a long right. time in terms of how it feels. But it's not long at all in terms of how long did it take for her to support the tank, and now they're talking about replacing her. Hmm. That's amazing. Uh, yes, that plus the rule that they would only anticipate ever having to replace somebody once a year. That's an odd rule, but okay. It was 1922. They didn't know any better. Right. So uh, she wants to blame everything on the uh, chancellor of the exchequer, her closest ally that she sacked because it didn't go well. Right. Right. And that was uh, rescinding the tax cuts on the rich. So she appoints in his stead a fellow named Jeremy Hunt, who is not an ally, who in fact Hmm. is from the opposite wing of the party, who thinks uh, fiscal stability is okay. He's probably a Rishi Sunak supporter, uh, if not openly, then then, uh, in his heart. (laughs) Okay. And so what does he do? He cancels almost the, all of the rest of her uh, uh, plans for the economy oh. that she had announced just well, a few yeah. days ago. Is that important? Not really. So uh, Hunt canceled almost all tax measures in the budget, which haven't started yet. Uh, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, Liz Truss had done is to say, look, I know it's going to take a a few days at least, if not months, to get everything straight. So while we cut taxes on the rich and the markets are in turmoil, we realize that you little people out there are suffering with winter coming and uh, economic uh, uh, doom and gloom because of rising prices, especially on energy. So we're going to freeze and cap energy prices, Liz Truss said. That's going to be part of the program. All right. And that's gone, too. Oh, she had excoriated the liberals for uh, not going with her program. She wanted to freeze them for two years. And she said, oh, the liberals are only going to do it for six months. You can't trust them. Little Hmm. people, you have to vote for us, not them. We're giving you something. They're giving you nothing. And Jeremy Hunt, the new guy, Chancellor of the Exchequer, said, no, we're not going to do it for two years. We're going to do it for six months. Oh, 
exactly the thing that they had been attacking the liberals for. Well, I got to say, that seems so backwards. You would have thought uh, ordinarily the liberals would be for freezing those prices for longer, but they're... Well, think of reasons. it as farm subsidies that uh, Trump gave Iowa. Ah, okay. Right? It's only for one thing. It's the election. We don't really care about it. The consequences are how long it lasts, how long as it lasts until the day after the election. Okay. All right. That's odd. Right. So Ian Dunt, the liberal columnist, writes, it's like watching a news item from another country, one of the countries Britain used to sneer at before we turned mm -hmm. into a complete basket case. The sudden urgent statements on market stability, the quivering sense of background anxiety, the desperate pleas. So the income tax cut on basic rate is gone. Energy price guarantees lasting only until spring. Dividends cut is gone. The only thing that remains really is, I think, a slight lowering in NI. That's national insurance. That's their equivalent to Social Security. All Otherwise, right. the whole budget has basically been scrapped. Hmm. A huge shift, the big shift, Jeremy Hunt only carrying out the energy support package until April. Review then. This was the big attack line from Trust to Starmer, Keith Keir Starmer, who is the uh, liberal head of the ah, party. Okay. I've, uh, I've promised a two-year plan, said Liz Trust, not anymore. So basically, she yes, has huh. nothing. She has nothing to offer. She doesn't know what to do. She can't explain it because she's terrible at press conferences. Oh, and that's, that's why everybody's turning on her. Well, and not uh, only that, okay. the Tories, remember, she's a, a Tory. She's a yeah. conservative, right. are saying, oh, look at what happened. She was going to subsidize uh, energy costs yeah. for the little people for two years. That was her manifesto. That was her plan. Obviously, she's failing because she's a socialist. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like, uh, what a strange thing for the conservatives to be doing. But OK. Well, well, now that she's falling, they're calling her out on it and saying, wait a minute. The reason you fell, you should have stayed with your whole plan that you started to begin with. You should have done trickle down economics. It's OK to lower taxes on the rich. But this subsidy plan, that's socialism. No wonder you've lost support. Ah, uh, that's what it was. Okay. Uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what it was. Interesting place to lay the blame. I mean, they got to do it somewhere. At least it sets things, you know, and if not right, then back on the tracks we're used to and in terms of accusations parties make against one another. Exactly. Weird. You know, okay. and again, why spend so much time there? Ah, because what right happens the there actually winds up coming here, be it uh, turmoil in the markets uh, interesting gas prices are actually coming down a little bit over there, which is uh, good for us if that's going to oh. be a worldwide sort of thing. All right. Uh, we don't know that. Uh, we have uh, uh, three weeks before the election and gas prices going up and uh, economic news not being good. That's certainly not good for Democrats. But at the same time, uh, turmoil makes things harder and even worse. Markets like stability and you're not getting stability from the United Kingdom, and that's why Elon Musk should just buy them. Because All right. they're going to be bargain basement it's cheap. It's a plan. Uh, it's gotten to the point where Reuters now has a piece out today. A fact box, how could British Prime Minister Trust be removed, and how would she be replaced? Just for those people who like to follow along and think that rules matter. Mm -hmm. I mean, they do, but you have to change them so you can keep up. That's yeah, all. but we have to explain them to you so that when they're broken, you know. Exactly. All so right. that's the news from overseas. Excellent. Of course, uh, a lot going on in Ukraine as well. All right. Time for, oh, by the way, time for a 2022 committee. They can update the name. <laughs> 2022, they right? Can just well, you know, all. things have happened so quickly and uh, so not expected uh, that maybe they need to. Maybe they need to revamp yeah. everything. But uh, they'll have time because they'll be in the uh, minority fairly fairly soon. Ah. Well, that'll Remember, uh, January world. 2025 is the latest an election can take place. But if things keep collapsing like this, it's going to be a lot sooner. Probably have like six elections between they now don't, and then. They don't want an election, the Tories. They have the majority right now in, in the uh, uh, parliament, and yeah, they don't they want like, to call an election, I assume which they could do because it. they'd get clobbered. So they want yeah. to put it off as much as possible. But if you don't have a leader, you really have no choice. Yeah, I mean, whatever. <laughs> Who knows about their system? But I, you would think that, uh, yes, they would rather have a leader and rather have somebody. Clearly, the uh, internal election didn't settle it. So how many options have you got? Internal, right. So external. obviously, the thing to do is to turn to the unpopular person that the MPs had selected, but the party members rejected because, you know, why not? I guess. Or else Boris Johnson again. Well, uh, yes. And so all of those things are on the table because, like, nothing's working. All right. 
<sighs> well, good luck. I don't know. Uh, how about King Richard? Bring him back. Uh, you should. Sure. Why not? You know, Robin Hood, Robin for that matter. <laughs> yes, right. They were going, why not Rob Let's from the rich and give to the poor? Sure. Absolutely. Everyone likes that hat he's got. It's wacky. All right. Well, good luck to the good luck United Kingdom. Have a great time. Right. Meanwhile, in the good UK, luck storm in the castle. Uh, you know that's going on. And meanwhile, in Ukraine, yes. uh, the, the counteroffensive, as it's being called, hmm. continues. And uh, uh, there's a lot going on there. Basically, uh, Putin's running out of things to do. We shot a bunch of missiles and uh, is buying Iranian. Uh, drones and trying to disrupt mm. things no. it, it's working in the sense that you can do damage it's not working in the sense it's going to change the course of the war yeah. in fact it won't you should buy uh, new recruits are at the front in ukraine they die in a few days um you know it, it's just so much of what he's trying to do is not working and so the question is going to be what's going to go on in russia because the only way to end this is really to get rid of putin in some fashion mm. and are they in any way shape or form ready to do that. This is a piece short, uh, which we'll go into after the break, which talks about uh, what we know about open criticism of Putin that we're starting to see from army leadership and the generals. Mm. Yeah, sounds dangerous. As you know, from their 1917 committee, you can only have a no confidence vote once a century. Uh, well, and once you away eliminate the person you're having uh, uh, the no confidence in, it's really difficult to bring them back. Right. And it's, uh, they, they really know how to dispose of party leaders there. So it's about as hard as bringing back uh, King Richard. And then claim Robert. it didn't happen. Uh, right. <laughs> that's, a, that's another thing. They're so very good at that. It, it uh, complicates issues. All right. Well, we'll check in with uh, what's going on there in two minutes. Let's uh, make something up real quick. Sup fam, it's your boy Darwin, aka Darwin underscore Darko, aka the most reasonable man in America, aka KITM's senior black correspondent. You might remember me from such recordings as Spaceman vs. Space Cadets and we Need to Talk About Joe Biden. Today, I want to bring you good news about that thing you've been struggling with. Do you suffer from giving too much of a damn? Do you turn on the series of tubes and find yourself outraged at the particular way some news organization strung some sentences together only to realize, nope, this is not some fictional hellscape? Well, guess what? You no longer have to accept the life of giving too much of a damn. You can do something about it because even you, yes, you can be a show contributor. Now I know what you're thinking. Hey, Mr. Most Reasonable Man in America, I'm not some professional podcast talking guy. Don't worry about it. Do you have a smartphone or some other electronic recording device? Well, that's all you need. You too can have a segment where you can read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Fair warning though, side effects may include general punditry, having opinions and hot takes, getting stuff off your chest, and hearing your own voice. If your recording lasts longer than five to seven minutes, please consult kagorx at gmail.com. That's K-A-G-R-O-X at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the Kagor in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. I am uh, now Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Somehow during the last two minutes, they worked that one out. So let's see if we can figure out what's going on in Ukraine and Russia, I don't know. Are you interested in the leadership job there, Greg? Uh, no. No? Not right. there, not here. All right. Very well. Uh, so so uh, Ilya we? Matviev is a political that scientist, guy. as he writes in his bio uh, on Twitter. Mm -hmm. He says, uh, a political scientist formerly based in St. Petersburg, Russia. Now, who knows? No. Okay. But, uh, you know, he does this for a living. Uh, and uh, someone else, written, is the uh, Janice word. Klug, had written, uh, the number one mistake in economic forecasts has always been and probably will always be underestimating adaptation, innovation, and resilience of market economies to external shocks. Hmm. And uh, Ilya Matviev writes, the common sense argument has always been that Russia, a small economy with 30 years of experience of capitalism, won't destroy or even significantly hurt Europe, the world's richest economic region that literally invented capitalism. The mm -hmm. idiocy of head-on confrontation. So he's certainly on the side of the West winning. And he has a thread here about recent public criticism of army leadership and what it all means. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Evgeny uh, Prizogin and Ramzan Kadriov have recently criticized the army leadership going as far as to name and shame specific generals. Okay. Uh, including uh, Shoigun, who's the uh, uh, Department ah, yeah. of Defense equivalent and uh, a close ally of Putin. Some suspect they represent the party of war within the Kremlin, you know, like the war bloggers who say, do more, do more, do more. Ah, yeah. Or even nascent hawkish opposition to Putin. I disagree, and here's why. This conflict involves a pattern familiar to any scholar of Russian politics. I guess no matter where you're based. Hmm, right. St. Saint, Saint Petersburg or who knows. Right. Uh, Putin, Putin sets up two or more centers of power and allows petty feuds between them by now. This is almost instinctive for him. Basically, what he does is sets uh, two groups that have almost equal power. Then he gets to decide. And because he gets to decide, they're beholden to him. And because he gets to, to decide, he's absolutely necessary. That's okay. basically what he's saying in terms of this tactic is. So as simple as this tactic is, and he gives examples this has served Putin well during his 22 years in power. To me, Putin's heavy reliance on Kadriov and Prishogin during this war represents the same old playbook, personality mm. dictatorship 101, but there's a catch. It's one thing to play such palace games in peacetime and another to do the same during Europe's most brutal war in 75 years. Mm. As the military right. experts and war correspondents, including Z war correspondents, the ones who are like really into this war, point out oh. the lack of proper coordination between Russia's motley crew of ground forces, the regular army, Kadriov's troops, uh, Prizhogin's uh, PMC, Donbass militias, results in diminished effectiveness. Russia's clan state or network state, I think Prizhogin is the guy that was going to uh, prisons to hire people. Oh, Okay, higher. <laughs> sure, right, the right. Wagner group. Yeah, got it. Uh, Russia's clan state or network state is ill-suited for war, clan which requires highly state. coordinated and rational organization that overrules political feuds. And furthermore, Kadriov and Prizhogin's attacks test the patience of the actual generals. Unlike hmm. Shoigo, who's well-versed in palace politics, the generals have never played the political games. They're now forced to play. They're also easily thrown under the bus by Putin. They're given the weakest hand, sure. all the responsibility, none of the influence. So is it smart to alienate generals during a war? Hmm. Well, about as smart as launching the war itself. I guess, although they are distracted. But... The bottom line, noises from these guys are well within the limits of typical Kremlin politics. But this kind of politics itself is out of touch with the reality of the war. And more defeats on the battlefield are coming, and Putin will eventually have to face the political consequences of a lost war. Mm. And uh, those arguments between those uh, political uh, centers of power, you know, is yeah. how it starts. Well, yes, that's true. That does pose a danger. On the other hand, I'm sure uh, Putin probably thinks, well, uh, a disorganized and disunited armed forces is my only hope of staying in power unless I win this thing outright, because otherwise they get together and... They kill me. Mm. So now if it's just warlords battling one another, then uh, he might survive. So let's turn to domestic politics. And uh, Jennifer Rubin has an interesting column today about oh, the no. media's unwillingness still to accurately describe Republican candidates. It's nothing new. Darn it. Why won't they? Uh, because uh, as Michael Jordan used to say, I don't like to talk politics because everybody buys shoes. Okay. Republicans, Democrats, that's basically the media's position, which uh, in a time where democracy is threatened is not good. Uh, but as a capitalist institution dedicated to the bottom line, which is to say their own pockets, you kind of understand where they're coming from. So, yeah, so Jennifer Rubin writes in a tweet, they, they spent they four live. years refraining from making simple observations about Trump's incoherence and uncontrolled rage as if it would have violated some journalistic code. And uh, she basically writes that uh, you can get better coverage of what's really happening with Republicans, like where Herschel Walker, you get better coverage from SNL, and uh, hmm. I would add, uh, and The Daily Show, and ah. places like that, and, and places like Daily Coast, than you do from the mainstream media. Well, that's true. Well, that's why we do. That's been true since do. the Iraq War, but you know, it's just amazing how little has changed in that time. Yeah. And uh, the, the model for uh, the papers themselves hasn't changed either. At some point, I think the, the, you know, the capitalist model is supposed to, 
you know, also motivate them to think, well, you know, if we enable authoritarianism, we might not be allowed to operate a business. And, you know, well, you know, and here's the other side of it that they're afraid to touch and literally afraid to touch. Yeah. Uh, This is by Perry Bacon, who's turned out to be just a fantastic columnist. Uh, He's over at the Washington Post and he writes, America's problem is white people keep backing the Republican Party. (laughs) All right. Just say it. It's true. Uh, He's done it for me. Right. A clear majority of white Americans keeps backing the Republican Party over the Democrats, even though the Republican Party is embracing terrible and at times anti-democratic policies and rhetoric. Uh, Whether it's uh, Kanye West's anti-Semitism or Donald Trump's anti-Semitism or anybody else's, which is now open because of all of the discussions and and uh, uh, public statements that uh, figures like those uh, two have made. Mm -hmm. The alliance between Republicans and white Americans is by far the most important and problematic dynamic in American politics today. And if that's true, and I think it is, because Democrats can't win unless they get 40% of the white vote. We seem to be important people. Get more than 40 attempt to win. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Non-Hispanic white Americans were about 85% of those who voted for Donald Trump in 2020. Uh, Much larger than the 59% of the U.S. population overall. In 2016, white voters were about 88% of Trump backers. It's likely that white Americans will be more than 80% of those who back Republican candidates this fall. Political discourse in America continues to ignore or play down the whiteness of the Republican coalition. Journalists and political commentators constantly use terms like middle America, working class, Mm, soccer moms. This is an issue. Yes, right. Right. In this year's campaign cycle, now. recently, apparently, uh, people of color, uh, black uh, families don't play soccer, according to this <laughs> telling, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, I mean, check the they world, don't work, but okay. They're not part of the union, you know, they just, they don't exist. In I this year's not. campaign Jeez. cycle, recent articles in The Post and other outlets have highlighted Georgia Democratic gubernatorial candidate Stacey Abrams' supposed weakness with black voters, which is strange uh, framing. It's likely that more than 70% of white voters in Georgia will back Kemp, but fewer than 20% of the state's black voters will vote for the incumbent. If Kemp wins re-election, it'll be because of white Georgians, not black ones. That's the same argument, yes. by the way, that uh, uh, the press just keeps uh, mangling. Democratic interference in Republican oh. primaries got yeah. Don Baldock and other extremists elected. No, they were elected because Republicans elected extremists. Yes. Right? I mean, and those... That's primaries that's where, to where the Democrats didn't have anything to do with what went on. They still elected extremists. Yeah, but they didn't interfere. They should have somehow. I don't know. Somehow. Yeah. I don't know. Right. Always. A, always a, even the results of a Republican primary are Democrats. Vote. Okay, Republican voters sure. are not just white people that four year college degrees. A group yeah. uh, Trump won by 32 points in 2020. Remarkable. I don't know what they're teaching at these colleges. That these are without four-year colleges. So oh, they didn't okay. Learn. I don't know what they're teaching at these other institutions that they're not going right. to. School or not. Guess. So that has been the common framing in much political commentary. The Republican Party, in fact, is the preferred choice of white people who describe themselves as evangelical Christians. Whom Trump won by 69 mm-hmm. points in 2020. White people in rural areas, Trump by 43. White people in the South, 29. White men, 17. White Catholics, 15. White Protestants who don't describe themselves as evangelicals, 14. White people in the Midwest, 13. White women, 7. And white people who live in the suburbs, 4. These numbers come from post-election surveys. In contrast, the people of color in these demographic groups, Asian Americans without four-year degrees, black Protestants, Latina women, mostly favor Democrats. So while the majority of white people with four-year degrees back Democrats in 2020, about 42% of them supported Trump, he also won more than 40% of white voters in the Northeast and in the West. The main block of white voters that overwhelmingly opposes Republicans is white people who aren't Christians. Hmm. Overall, right. Republicans win the majority of white voters, 55-43 nationally in 2020 in most elections, and being the party of white Americans is given and will continue to give Republicans two huge advantages. First, white Americans are about 72% of the electorate, 13 percentage points more than their share in the overall population. That is to say, white people vote at higher percentages than non-white people. Yes. White adults are more likely than Asian and Hispanic adults to be citizens. The median age for a white American is higher. 
Uh, older Americans tend to vote at higher rates if the electorate mirrored the country's actual demographics and the groups voted as they did in 2020. Trump would have won only about 44 percent of the national vote, three points less than his 47. And that that would be where I thought he, he should deserve to be. But that's not what happened. Well, I mean, that's overstating what I think he deserves, but I see what you mean. Second, the Electoral College and the Senate gives outsized power to less populated states. We know that. And they are disproportionately white. So perhaps the best way to understand American politics is an overwhelmingly white coalition facing one that's majority white, but includes a lot of people of color. And so Democrats do a lot of white appeasement to address this Republican tilt, nominating white candidates in key races, moving right or white on racialized issues such as policing and immigration. And uh, that's why the press immediately said Mandela Barnes is not a good fit for Wisconsin. What do they mean by that? They're wrong. But that he's right. progressive or that he's black? Yeah, that's it. Progressive. Boy, do they they just hate. Well, uh, that's that's a pretty stark example. But, you yeah. know, that's Rick. You know, that's why uh, we said, look, uh, we didn't know that Mandela Barnes is going to be the nominee. But, you know, that defunding the police as a slogan is going to be used as a cudgel, as a shillelagh, shillelagh. <laughs> and, it's, and it's going to be against All right. <laughs> uh, black people. Uh, sure, because, you know, if you're going to hit somebody, that's that's where the history is. That's the history tells you who's going to catch a beating. And because white people Gosh. are likely to be the majority of voters for at least Delivering two more decades, people. America's in trouble. Across the country, GOP officials are banning books in public libraries, making it harder for non-Republicans to vote, stripping black political power. The majority of America's white voters are enabling and encouraging the GOP's radical anti-democratic turn by continuing to back the party in elections. Mm -hmm. It's not, as much of our political discourse implies, Democrats have a working class or middle America or non-college vote problem. They have a white voter problem. And there's no sign it's going to go away anytime soon. Well, And so economic anxiety? Racism. That's, well, yeah. I mean, same okay. thing. Fair enough. That was known for a long time. I'm thinking yes. of... Uh, but, yeah, but the, you know, people forget from election to election and somehow it went away and this, that, and everything the, else. Yeah. I'm thinking of all the uh, demographers and uh, Roy Tejera types who have been documenting the emerging uh, non-white majority in various places and then eventually at some point, you know, the, the scales tip at the... Uh, nationally... Um, and uh, I didn't I, you know, I'll have to go back and see how much uh, attention they give to the possibility that oh, all this may be for naught if we turn into a totalitarian or white minority rule state that simply makes it impossible for people of uh, people of color and other minorities to actually express their political preferences. We, we well, didn't but count who is white and who is not white at any given time mm -hmm. is, oh, as yeah, they like to say, true, true. a construct. Yeah. And here's uh, an example. Brent Staples over at the New York Times uh, has a related theme. He tweets, mm -hmm. uh, bear in mind that immigrants often adopt anti-blackness as part of the Americanizing process in the quest to become white people in good standing. Look no further than the L.A. Mm. City Council uh -huh. secret tapes that were revealed forcing uh, yeah. uh, uh, some who are in power do, do look for uh, to uh, to resign. Yes. Or racist comments. Uh, you don't have to look that much further, but I encourage you to look further. So he gives some examples, and here are some uh, old books uh, with titles that are just really fascinating when you hmm. look at them. And I'll give you uh, some examples. Oh, if I haven't given you that thread, there it is. And if I have given it to you, here's an easy way to find it. And here's one example of the image of book covers over the years uh -huh. that he's found as an example. This one, uh -huh. Working yeah. Toward Whiteness by David Rodiger, The Strange Journey from Ellis Island to the Suburbs, Working Toward Whiteness, How America's Immigrants Became White. All right. How the Irish Became White. I see. Is a different book. This one is by uh, Noel Ignatiev, Whiteness of a Different Color, European Immigrants and the Alchemy of Race. Hmm. Uh, and uh, in 2019, the New York Times had an opinion piece called How Italians Became White. Right. Because when they first came to this country, they weren't considered such. Right. Columbus Day story, tracking closely with that. How the Boston Irish became white. Hmm. 
Why can't story, anybody yeah. else? And so, and why you should know, they? Uh, I don't know. The, the point but is, uh, it's a it's a socialized to? way of thought, uh, which is uh, pretty common. Yes. Well, I, I wonder how much of it has to do with uh, acceptance among the the original white people, realizing that they were losing their grip on, on power and majority. You start to assimilate other people who are like, well, I think we can survive by making them white. If we grant them whiteness, uh, they'll come over to our side. I mean, it's, a, it's good politics. It's been around for a while. It uh, uh, makes good sense. But uh, I guess at some point they're uh, then then they start drawing the line, and which is just entirely superficial. Well, that face, I just can't turn that into a white person. Can't make it work. Sorry, uh, we're just going to have to rescind your right to vote instead. That's so uh, how does all of this play out in the election? Again, tough to know. We're kind of in a 50-50 election thing. The New York Times poll uh, today wasn't uh, from Siena. wasn't great news for Democrats. It's uh, increasing salience of the economy, according to them, although there's reasons to be skeptical about this particular poll. So as always, throw it on the pile, take the average, yada, yada. It's a likely voter screen. One of the things that uh, uh, that was picked up by Karen Tumulty in this particular poll, uh, which shows uh, movement toward Republicans. uh, Again, one thing she didn't say, one thing she did, one thing she didn't say, which is something we've talked about. And that is that uh, things always, quote, tighten, end quote, as the election gets closer, oh, as the I undecideds see. come off the fence. There are structural reasons why things tend to move toward Republicans in that regard. Uh, but as a likely voter screen, you know, we have the issue, of course, who is a likely voter. But one of the things that Karen uh, Tumulty picked up is looking at the crosstabs. One striking thing in the crosstabs, women are a dead even split 47-47 on the generic ballot. And only 5% of voters say abortion is their top issue. That seems... Do you believe that? No. I don't either. That's why I'm saying I'm mm. a little skeptical of the poll. Just put it on the pile. Okay. But, you know, again, as we talked about last week, this is polar coaster time. Mm. Oh, we got a good poll. That's great. Oh, we got a bad poll. That's great. Are the Democrats getting good polls still? Yes, they are. Uh, you know, oddly enough... Uh, one of the things that uh, was striking is that when you get a bad poll for Democrats, it must be true, say the media. Huh, right. But if you get a bad poll for Republicans, obviously it's an outlier. Right. Sure. So here's that, an outlier. Uh, the best pollster in the country, Ann Seltzer, polled the Chuck Grassley race. Mm. And uh, Grassley leads by three. That's okay. a shocking result. Grassley was expected to clean up. Well, and, and Seltzer says, well, well, what it says days. to me is that her opponent, Franken, Mike Franken, is running a competent campaign and has a shot to defeat the seemingly invincible Chuck Grassley, previously mm. perceived to be invincible. So uh, that goes along with a bunch of other polls that we've had all season, uh, which do that. And then there's this focus group uh, from Axios. Pennsylvania swing voters aren't sold on a switch driving the news. Trump to Biden swing voters in Pennsylvania in our latest Axios focus group favored Mm. Democrats or split ticket midterm ballots saying if Republicans retake power, they'll push a nationwide abortion ban and focus on revenge investigations against Biden and his party. Driving the news. These are the major takeaways from our two focus groups. Why it matters. These voters disappointment with Biden and the economy and rising anxiety about crime aren't persuading them to embrace Republicans. How it works, all 13 participants voted for former President Trump in 2016, Biden in 2020, six registered Republicans, six Democrats, one independent. And while a focus group isn't statistically significant, the responses show how some voters are thinking and talking about current events. And uh, nine out of the 13 favored Fetterman and eight out of 13 preferred Josh Shapiro. Okay. Just what they're saying. I've seen what happens when celebrities become in a position of power. I don't oh. enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Some question Oz's allegiance to Pennsylvania. And why not? He doesn't live there. Uh, some people are worried about Fetterman's health. Bob yeah. G., a Republican, who said he's not a MAGA Republican, wants to see his party separate from Trump and gets nervous about who's driving the GOP agenda. He's backing Oz because of the economy. But Mastriano's <laughs> extremism is so troubling that uh, he'll vote for Shapiro or nobody. Huh. 
So the bottom okay. line, while specific issues matter to these Pennsylvania swing voters, a larger consideration seems to be the candidate character. Think Georgia. In the case of the Senate race, it's also which party will be in control in 2023. So uh, there's just so many different cross currents. That's why it's so hard to figure out what's going on, despite and uh, because of polls like the New York Times. They're quite properly picking up increased anxiety about the economy. How that turns out in the election Mm -hmm. is a function of who turns up. And we don't know that yet. And the whole thing about likely voters this year. So I'm not just saying, oh, you got to be careful of likely voters because I don't like this poll. I'm saying you got to be careful of likely voters because we've been saying it for a month. True. And yeah, this came, the, the poll came after the warning. So fair enough. We were warned, warned ahead of time and then now we don't know. And also I think uh, I saw some complaints about the sample size of the thing, which is a well, I was ignoring that. that. Okay. Yeah. People All say right. that when they don't like polls. Yeah. Okay. Well, they didn't. So they didn't like this one. So they said that. I Sam mean, it wasn't a very good poster. Tiny. Nate Cohen is a very good analyst. Okay. And the poll says what it says. And, uh, you know, you look at the cross tabs and wonder a little bit. I simply don't believe that only 5% of women think that abortion is like really important. The most I, important yeah. thing. Hmm. I don't know. Or where that if comes they from. do think that the economy is the thing, but I'm still voting for Democrats because of abortion, that's not going to get picked up in this poll. Hmm. It'll get picked up in focus groups. True, that's I guess you can still them. say that. Well, it's extremely important to me, but no, I'm voting uh, chiefly. Uh, I'm, I was always going to vote the other way, you know, against Republicans on abortion. But also I'm worried about the economy and something else. OK, I, but still, yeah, 5 percent. I don't think so. 10. Uh, I wouldn't even believe that, quite honestly. And I think we talked about Mike Lee last week about the fact that Evan McMullen uh, leads in one poll and trails by uh, not more than a couple of points in another. Okay. And uh, Mike Lee's getting very nervous. He went on Sean Hannity to beg for Romney's support. Oh, okay. Which I thought was kind of interesting. And in that regard, uh, I saw a sort of interesting article about... um, well, there's two. There's this one from Tom Nichols, J.D. Vance, and the Collapse of Dignity, American Politics are Now Cruel Burlesque. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Basically, uh, Tim Ryan's decent, J.D. Vance is not. They held their first debate last night in Cleveland, he writes. I wrote last year about why I found Vance so execrable, but my friend Jim Swift, a native Ohioan, argued today that while Ryan gave a serviceable performance, he didn't beat Vance into the ground. And given how far Ohio has gone in a MAGA direction, that's what he needed to do. One moment struck me, though. Of course, the same one that we covered. At a rally in Ohio last month, Trump declared, J.D. is kissing my ass. He wants my support so bad while Vance was standing right by the stage. Mm -hmm. Last night, Ryan slammed Vance for selling his dignity. I don't know anybody I grew up with. I didn't know anybody I went to high school with that would allow somebody to take their dignity like that and get back on stage. We need leaders who have courage to take on their own party. I've proven that. And he was called an ass kisser by the former president. I understood Ryan's exasperation. I'm not from Ohio, but I was raised in a working class neighborhood where I grew up. If you sneered that a man was kissing your ass and said it to his face, that other fellow might react by knocking you on that particular part of your anatomy. But Vance's reaction to Trump calling him a spineless loser at his own rally was to run up to Trump like a puppy that just got a treat, wagging his tail for another tasty biscuit. Yeah, that's awesome. kind of bad. Possible, even likely, Vance will gain a sentence, but he can never regain his dignity. He doesn't seem to care, and neither, apparently, do voters. Right. Well, that's that's the big problem. They're not all wholly into dignity, uh, dignity, or diggity, for that matter. Diggity, diggity, yeah. dude. Hot, hot dignity talk. <laughs> all right. Uh, yes, uh, nobody really uh, doing a great job making themselves look like uh, upstanding manly men, whether in Ohio or uh, I did see over the weekend that uh, in Pennsylvania, Dr. Oz, somebody pulled tape of him. Uh, I feel like we're back in the middle of COVID pandemic miracle cure days. Uh, I, I don't know, pondering on television uh, have, and wondering why hasn't everybody been curious about the taste of their own urine? And the answer to that in Pennsylvania and elsewhere, I think, probably still a resounding no. Um, right. But maybe that's what the coal miners want to hear. So uh, it's a medical student thing. <laughs> okay, is it? 
<laughs> well, in some see, if you have diabetes, yeah, and you have high sugar, one of the things <laughs> that'll right. happen is sugar will spill over into your urine. Sure, right? Why not? Where else and are you going to put it? If you pee a lot, yeah, uh, because uh, sugar makes that happen. Yeah, it sucks in water, and then you have to pee. Okay. Well, that's how the ancients, that's how the Greeks, that's how uh, the old world yeah. recognized that it was diabetes, hence the term diabetes mellitus, sweet. Oh, well, I That's to be distinguished from uh, a different disorder where uh, you don't have regulatory chemicals in your body working properly, so you pee a lot, but the urine is not sweet. Mm. And that's called diabetes insipidus. Oh. Well. Because it's like neutral urine. Well, how do listen, you tell the difference between people, sweet urine and neutral urine? I uh, pay a guy. In, in <laughs> 1400. Yeah. Uh, you and surf. the answer is you taste it. I don't know. So it's not like a rite of passage that at the full moon, you know, in uh, on October 31st, medical students will wind up tasting urine. It's that in some anatomy classes or in some mm. uh, you know uh, 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 chemical uh, chemistry classes or biochem classes yes. uh, you may have had the opportunity to do this to see the difference between sweet urine and insipid urine I feel like they and so a test that's for this. you know if you're explaining you're losing I'm just saying <laughs> you know Oz <laughs> takes this and says, well all Americans are like me yeah. All of you went to medical school and had the opportunity to do this, right? I mean, and it's not so weird. It's not so school, yuck. It's not so disgusting, school. right? <laughs> and everybody yeah. else is looking at us and saying, what the heck is wrong with this? Yeah. Thing? Now, that's if, where it came from. Yeah. What he needed to say was, yeah, well, it's no worse than the beer at the uh, Pittsburgh Stadium. You right. Know, something in fact, like uh, in some ways, it's better. It's at least yeah. sweeter. Right. Well, I mean, you know, he could have gone with that. But instead, he goes with, well, you know, right, all salt of the earth Americans you know, Basically, because Americans you know how salty they are. Now, if you want to get a, a, a craft beer, that's a different story mm. altogether. Right. Well, that's what Oz produces. But Bud Weiser, not so much. All right. Well, yeah. Good luck trying to, you know, normalize that, Dr. Oz. <laughs> And uh, it was a good ending for the weekend. For right. Me. You're in a crude taste. That's what we have at uh, <laughs> our gatherings. Oh, okay. All right. Well, we'll check in with you on Wednesday. See what you're drinking. All right. Welcome back now to the Kegel in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. I think we engineered the exit properly at this point. But uh, yeah, sometimes when uh, well, Greg was hanging up, we had so much fun with his uh, departure on Thursday. And everybody enjoyed that. Um, and he timed it correctly this time, but sometimes he, uh, hangs up and instead of making the straight hang up sound, it just tells Skype that some, there's no longer any connection and Skype tries to reconnect and it makes a totally different sound. And that's definitely not his fault. All right. Well, uh, now we have an explanation for why Dr. Oz at some point in his long career, not political career, but television, uh, career, actually voluntarily brought up the fact that he had uh, that he because he was a medical student uh, had taken the opportunity to taste his own urine for reasons because you know the ancients had to do it nobody has any kind of test now to tell you what's in your urine without actually drinking it why would you develop such a thing uh but doesn't everybody like it? Doesn't everybody have a little bit of curiosity about that? And I'm I'm thinking that even among medical students, there's probably a significant contingent that just say, you know what, never mind. I'm just not going to – I will use one of those test strips, and that will tell me whether it's sweet or not. And quite honestly, I don't need to taste for myself or double-check the work of the, uh, the, the strip here. Uh, I'll just let the – the technology take care of things. But it's interesting for him to think that everybody had the same natural curiosity. He didn't even have to be a medical student. He was going to he was going to take a drink regardless. Apparently, he's just super curious about this lovely stuff that he just can't wait. All right. Well, anyway, so I'm not saying we all have to. Yeah. All right. Well, uh I, I don't know what's up with the guy, <laughs> but uh, at any rate, it's not the sort of thing I would recommend 
forget the medical part of it. Like, okay, if it's a part of medical training, it's part of medical training. I'd leave it behind afterwards and maybe not bring it up again. But he probably at the time he brought it up on the air, he had no idea he would be running for Senate because that sounds like something he came up with overnight one day and said, hey, you know what? Whatever. I'm famous. Uh, I have lots of money I could burn. I could turn that into political power. All of a sudden, I realize I want to have political power, so I'll go and do it. But, yeah, uh, I mean, um, political consulting-wise, I'd probably say, yeah, not really the sort of thing that I think you're going to find a lot of common ground with or, or lots of uh, uh, the the MAGA republic. although, you know, they'll say anything. I mean, if Trump said, yeah, I drink my own urine, they would all be drinking their own urine. I, I don't have much doubt about that. But I don't think Dr. Oz has that kind of clout. And uh, I'll tell you what, I mean, he... He didn't pull the tape himself, right? He didn't go around saying, you know, what's really going to, you know, help me get across the finish line is I'll tell everybody that uh, I'm interested in, was interested, still interested in tasting my own urine. And we all know you are, too. So here's this clip. But, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't think it's going to make or break the election. It just happened over the weekend. And... Don't think it's going to help a great deal. And, you know, again, if you're explaining that, if you're explaining you're losing, if you're explaining urine drinking, I think you're definitely losing. So there we are. All right. Let's see. Other stories that may or may not involve urine and what to do with it. I don't know. This is the uh, interesting story that I kicked off with because I spent some time reading it over the weekend. Washington Post was reporting it. It was an exclusive at the time. I don't know whether the exclusive has run out. I don't know whether our author here, Drew Harwell, has ever tasted his own urine, had any interest in doing so, uh, whether he is, in, for all I know, Dr. Oz is interested in sampling a flight of urines from several of his own colleagues or patients, uh, maybe the entire panel, maybe the entire audience of his show. And uh, I wonder where it was that he, was he on his own show when he said that? And was it, were they discussing that? I wonder how, I do wonder what the context was. And then why not everybody in the whole audience? Everybody pee in a cup and I'll test it for you. Yeesh. Anyway, this has nothing to do with that. This has something to do with Donald Trump, whose hair is the color of urine, but we don't know why. Co-founder of Trump's media company details Truth Social's bitter infighting. And I can't believe that there's bitterness uh, in either in urine or in the infighting surrounding the former guy. Will Wilkerson is the name of the guy. And there's a couple of players here I've never heard of. And uh, I lost track of their names during the initial reading of the piece. Uh, maybe you will too. But anyway, maybe uh, we'll learn who these guys are and they'll become more famous as the as time goes on and they press their claims. Will Wilkerson. It's not hard to remember the name once you've heard it. One of Trump Media and Technology Group's first employees alleges that the company violated securities law and that Trump pressured executives to hand over their shares to his wife, not Wilkerson's wife, Donald Trump's wife, you know, Melania. He shared a cache of internal documents with the Post and federal investigators that says uh, that he says supports his claims. So we don't know. We'll see. Uh, a lot of the people who are around Trump tend to be almost as dumb as Trump and sometimes don't have any idea whether or not documents that they offer to support their claims actually do support their claims. But this seems like a rather complete story. Drew Harwell wrote it up for the Washington Post and it runs like this. Will Wilkerson. What's his name again? Wilkerson. Will Wilkerson. Really? Then an executive at former President Donald Trump's startup, Trump Media and Technology Group, was at a Fort Lauderdale, Florida coffee shop with company co-founder Andy Latinsky. Latinsky and Wilkerson are the main players in this besides Trump. He was there last October when Trump called Latinsky with a question. Would he give up some of his shares, Latinsky's shares in this company, to Trump's wife, Melania? Now, that's a weird request as it is, but you'll see exactly how weird a request it is as things go on. But do you remember like the origins of Trump Social? 
or Truth Social that uh, they were they started the thing, but they didn't have any you know product or capital or anything like that. But they merged with um, one of the I forget what they call them, uh, but we'll be reminded later on in the story. But a a, a company that's publicly traded. But that it, that does also likewise has no product. They exist for the purpose of using the capital that they raise, selling stock in themselves to acquire another company, a private company, and take it public by absorbing it into their public company. All right. Well, at any rate, uh, so first we find out that Latinsky and Wilkerson are sitting in a coffee shop. Call comes in from the former guy. Will you give up some of your shares to my wife, Melania? Trump Media, the owner of the fledgling social network Truth Social, had just been boosted by a huge merger agreement and a flood of investment that had made the stake worth millions of dollars. It wasn't even necessarily the fact that it was worth millions of dollars that made it such an unusual request, but but that helps. Well, anyway, Trump had already, this is the part that really struck me, Trump had already been given 90% of the company's shares in exchange for the use of his name and some minor involvement, leaving everyone else to split the rest. So mind you, 90% of the company is owned by Trump. 10% 10% of the company is owned by everybody else involved in the company. Well, not everybody else. I'm sure they didn't give stock to everyone who's working on it. But okay, so the executives split the other 10% of the con- company among themselves. Trump wants shares for Melania for some reason. <clears throat> and, or I guess Melania says, can I have some shares in this? I want to be independently uh, rich on my own or have more money or something. I don't know whether she, maybe it wasn't even her idea. She had no idea that she was going to get this. Or maybe she was never going to get it. He was just going to keep it. I don't know. But Trump, who owns 90% of the place, calls the people with 10% and says, give some to Melania. 90% of it is this. If he wants Melania to have some shares, he can give her his shares. But he never gives anybody his anything. So he calls the people with part of the 10% and says, I want you to give that to Melania, which one, on its face is ridiculous. And two, Melania ought to be insulted. You're calling a guy who probably controls no more than 2% of the stock and you want to give me that? You've got 90%. I get some portion of this guy's 2%. But again, she may have had nothing to do with it. Who knows? Anyway, well... That seemed rather odd, right? Latinsky tried to brush it off, telling Trump, quote, the gift would have meant a huge tax bill that he couldn't pay. He's saying if he gifts the 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 shares to Melania, he's taxed on the transaction. I don't know how that works, but apparently he says, I don't have the cash to pay the tax bill on that. Because at the moment, you know, in the excitement of this merger with this, what was it, SPAC special purpose acquisition company. Maybe that was it. Anyway, this merger boosts their stock price. So at the, at that time, even a small percentage of the company was worth a considerable amount of money and he didn't have the money to pay the taxes on that. So Wilkerson, apparently during an interview with, I guess, uh, our writer here, Drew Harwell says, I heard Latinsky say, I can't give her that. The gift would have meant a huge tax bill that he couldn't pay. Trump, of course, didn't care. He said, do whatever you need to do. I love that. That's his answer for all that. Well, here's what I need to do. I need to not give you that stock is the answer. But what you meant was do whatever you need to do to be able to pay that tax bill and give me the stock. Five months later, Latinsky, who first met Trump in 2004 as a contestant on the TV show The Apprentice, was abruptly removed from the company's board. Wilkerson said he believes it was payback for his refusal to turn over a small fortune to the former president's wife. Latinsky thought so too, according to an email Wilkerson and his attorneys shared with the Washington Post and the Securities and Exchange Commission. In that email, Latinsky complained that Trump was, quote, retaliating against me by threatening to, quote, blow up the company if his demands were not met. That's, you know, that's how you make great deals. Threaten to blow up the company that's paying you for essentially not only a no-show job, but a no-do-anything job 
and you own 90% of the shares just because of your super famous name. And you're going to ruin that. You know, I mean, I guess it's up to you. But uh, he can hurt other people along the way, and that's what he loves to do. So he threatens to do it. Pretty interesting also, by the way, that they are apprentice alums. So like you go on his show, you make money for him, you make nothing, you end up getting fired from that show, but you try and trade on your association with Trump for the rest of your life. And then guess what happens? The closer you get to him, the more he takes from you and you learn the lesson once and for all that everything Trump touches dies. And now Truth Social will, too. Latinsky did not respond to emails and phone messages. It is unknown whether he still retains his shares. So they're trying to talk to him directly about this, but they're going to have to get this story for now through Will Wilkerson instead. Here is the um, text, I guess, or what is it, uh, or email, rather, from Andy Latinsky making this complaint. It's embedded here. Um, I don't know who Lori is, but that's who he's writing to. Hi, Lori. I found out yesterday from Philip Juhan, the CFO of Trump Social, that a letter was sent purporting to remove me from the board of directors. There was no meeting convened to do this and no proper protocol was followed. Uh Uh-oh, the rules. Hmm. This is also a violation of the services agreement of UAV TMTG, the company name, I guess. Now, as you are aware as well as John Haley, all the other TMTG shareholders, Wes Moss and Brad Cohen. President Trump over the past two months has repeatedly demanded that I turn, I give my TMTG equity to Melania Trump. As I informed him several times, I have earned that equity and gifting equity to Melania Trump would be a taxable event of which I can't afford to pay the taxes, on which he should have said, but okay. Trump has said multiple times to me and to John Haley that he will, quote, blow up the company if his demands are not met. Trump is now retaliating against me, and I will be seeking counsel. I think he actually they get quoted this whole thing later on in the article. I could have just read on the email. One of hundreds of previously unreported company messages, documents, photos, and audio recordings that Wilkerson has provided to the SEC in connection with a whistleblower submission reveals a stunning, not if you know him, stunning portrait of the animosity that is built up inside Trump media since its high profile debut last year. And by the way, if you want to take extra glee in this, remember how much money, Murdery Trader Green uh, invested in this thing because it was a sure winner and they were going to be going public soon and Trump's name was associated with it and she put her, uh, you know, a significant chunk of money in it and now uh, the stock is tanking. So hooray for that. Promoted as the centerpiece of Trump's post-presidential business ambitions, which has now collapsed, the company has marketed itself, had marketed itself as a budding media empire with enterprises planned in social media, video streaming, live events, and online payments. A powerful rival, not just to Twitter, but Disney, Google, and Amazon. They had real delusions of grandeur here. But inside the company, Wilkerson said, those plans gave way to bitter infighting, technical failures, and a chaotic jockeying for power among Trump allies that undermined its potential, it had none really, and left some employees crying at their desks. Because Trump touched it, now they die. Wilkerson, who was fired from his job Thursday as a senior vice president of operations at the company after he spoke to the Post, filed the whistleblower complaint with the SEC in August. The complaint drafted by Wilkerson's attorneys alleges that the company's bid to raise money via an investment vehicle known as a special purpose acquisition company, there it is, or SPAC, S-P-A-C, relied on, you'll never believe it, fraudulent misrepresentations in violation of federal securities law. And who would guess that Donald Trump would engage in fraudulent misrepresentation in a stock scheme? That's crazy. The SEC, a federal watchdog agency, allows members of the public to submit tips, complaints, and referrals about suspected financial wrongdoing via a document the agency calls a Form TCR. Whistleblowers can be granted confidentiality protections and, in some cases, financial awards. Latinsky did not join in the complaint, interestingly enough. Wilkerson is cooperating with investigations into Trump media by the SEC and federal prosecutors from the Southern District of New York. 
said his attorneys, Phil Brewster, Patrick Mincy, and Stephen Bell. Among the materials he filed with the SEC's whistleblower office is a detailed day-to-day computer log compiled by company co-founder Wes Moss, Latinsky, and Wilkerson about their daily company-related activities. He also provided to the Post a copy of that log, as well as numerous other memos, photographs, and videos that chronicled the creation of Trump media. All of the materials Wilkerson shared with the Post were previously provided to government investigators, his attorneys said. The SEC and the SDNY declined to comment. In an SEC filing in December, Digital World Acquisition, they're going to acquire the whole world, digitally speaking, that's the SPAC that was pushing to take Trump media public, is uh, or acknowledged that the SEC was investigating and had sought documents related to the merger with Trump media. In another filing in June, Digital World said it had become aware that a federal grand jury in the Southern District of New York had issued subpoenas to its board members seeking documents related to its initial public offering filings and communications with or about multiple individuals. The investigations, the company said, could impede or prevent the merger. So they're not done yet. Wilkerson said he was still working for the company on October 6th when his SEC complaint was first reported by the Miami Herald. A Trump media attorney sent Wilkerson a letter that night suspending him for what the lawyer said was a, quote, blatant violation of his non-disclosure agreement. After interviewing Wilkerson alongside his attorneys, the Post on Wednesday sent a detailed list of claims and questions raised by Wilkerson's allegations to representatives for Trump, Trump Media, and the Trump Organization, Trump's long-running family business. Now, of course, under investigation by the uh, New York State Attorney General as well. Only Trump Media among that group responded, saying in a statement that Trump, as company chairman, had hired former Congressman Devin Nunes, you remember him, as CEO to, quote, create a culture of compliance and build a world-class team to lead Truth Social. Okay, you know, corporate speak. The company said it was already a success, having launched on the Apple and Google app stores, executed multiple feature updates, and attracted millions of users. Ignoring these achievements, the Washington Post sent us an inquiry rife with knowingly false and defamatory statements and other concocted psychodramas. The statement did not directly address any of Wilkerson's claims. Trump media fired Wilkerson on Thursday, citing his unauthorized disclosures to the Post. Brewster, his attorney, called the termination patent uh, retaliation, patent patent, Never did straighten that out. Retaliation against an SEC whistleblower of the worst kind. That is, that the retaliation was. He's not the worst kind of whistleblower. They probably should have rewritten that sentence. Digital World Acquisition has asked shareholders, and I guess there's only like three, to give the company more time to finalize the merger, which would unlock hundreds of millions of dollars for Trump media, but is effectively frozen pending the outcomes of the federal investigations. Digital World and its chief executive, Patrick Orlando, did not respond to requests for comment. The revelations to the SEC from Wilkerson, the most prominent company official to speak publicly about its operations, come at a turbulent time for Trump Media's business. Investors, discouraged by the halted merger, have sent the SPAC's share price plunging from a high of $175 to less than $18 on Friday. Roughly 4 million users follow Trump on the company's sole product, Truth Social, far below his Twitter peak of 88 million. The company has pledged to investors it would surpass 50 million users by 2024. In past public statements, Nunes, Orlando, and Trump have argued that Trump media will ultimately prove to be a successful business, but Wilkerson said he expects its internal problems could lead the company to fall apart. We weren't trying to be Trump Org 2.0, he said. We always saw Trump as the rocket fuel to send this thing into space. I wanted this to succeed more than anything, but these are glaring issues and they're threatening me now for calling them out. I couldn't stay quiet anymore. So about what? Let's find out. Next section, the Avengers. I don't know what that's supposed to mean, but Wilkerson, 38, isn't a traditional Trump critic. 
when Latinsky and Moss, another former Apprentice contestant, first started discussing the idea of a multi-pronged Trump media business after Trump's November 2020 election loss, the men had asked for his help developing the business, Wilkerson said. Not that he could actually help you. They, he, they wanted his name. And that's probably about it. Maybe they actually believed in his business acumen. They were apprentice contestants. A form, although they would have a better look than anybody at the fact that he lacked any sort of business acumen entirely. A former executive producer for Latinsky's conservative radio show. He is a, one of those as well. Wilkerson, Wilkerson was excited about monetizing the following of a person he considered a master marketer with 40 years as a political and household name. Wilkerson shared a photo from that time of the men sketching the original concept on a whiteboard titled Trump's New Media Empire that would ultimately compose the company's public pitch, including new business lines, the Trump digital subscription line, Trump documentaries, etc., and a chain of Trump technologies, including in, uh, including in servers and online payments. So they were going to you know, vertically integrate every part of the media empire, the online social media empire that they were looking to build, the way people would pay for it, uh, uh, who would be in it, who would be on it, uh, who would have shares in it, uh, <clears throat> how it would be served, <clears throat> pardon me, served to the web, et cetera, et cetera. They just figured on owning all of these things at some point. After Trump supporters stormed the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021, and Trump was banned from major social networks, the men drew up plans for a tech platform that would be resilient to cancel culture and the impact of bias against the right, according to the Daily Log Wilkerson shared with the Post and the SEC. To meet with Trump, the men sought help from another apprentice contestant, Bradford Cohen, a Florida criminal defense attorney who represented two rappers, Lil Wayne and Kodak Black, to whom Trump had granted clemency on his final day in the White House. So they figured Bradford Cohen, I mean, he's just another apprentice candidate, so or a uh, contestant. So are they. Why do they need his help? Well, he's recently been in touch with Trump and gotten some real world uh, results for clients he's represented, so maybe he's an in. Maybe they have, he has more pull with Trump than we do. He doesn't care about his former contestants. In late January, three weeks after the riot, Cohen, Latinsky, and Moss met with Trump at Pervalago, his opulent sex club and home and club, yes, in Palm Beach, Florida, to discuss the idea. Over cheeseburgers, Diet Coke, and ice cream, because he's trying to lose weight, the men offered to build Trump a media company that he would own 90% of without putting in any of his own money, which is a great way to get him to agree. Wilkerson said he was interested, and Trump Media was born. So that's how you get Trump Media, right? You go to Trump and you say, we'll do all the work, we'll put up all the money, you'll own 90% of it, will you do it? Of course Trump says yes to that. Cohen and Moss did not respond to requests for comment, by the way. Raising money, however, proved to be a major challenge because they didn't have any of their own. And other investors look at it and say, let me get this right. If I put money in, the most I could own is 10% if you give me all your shares because Trump already has 90% of the company. So who are they going to get money from? They're only going to get money from people who say, I'm looking to burn this money in exchange for garnering favor with Trump. I know from the outset, all I'm doing is handing over cash that I have and giving it to Trump and hoping that he'll say thank you to me one day by granting me some favor or another. There's no chance that a company will be built out of this when 90% of the money goes to Trump. So, okay. Raising money proved to be a major challenge. The investment bankers, they called, rejected them because of fears over Trump's post-election behavior, Wilkerson said. And I mean, that's the wrong answer. The investment bankers that you called rejected you because 90% of the equity was already off the table. And not only that, it was in the hands of somebody who was, you know, habitually stealing equity anyway. So, you know, it's just a bad bet. It's a stupid pitch. 
But, you know, whatever. They probably told him, well, you know how it is post uh, January 6th. That, that's a soft way of letting him down. So they started cold calling SPACs. That's the only other. That's how they ended up, you know, coming up with that idea to raise capital. Known as blank check companies, and they love blank checks. SPACs sell shares to investors before merging with a private company, allowing the combined business to make money on the stock market without abiding by the traditional transparency requirements of a public listing. So not only is it a weird situation, it's a, it's designed as a workaround to get around disclosure requirements from the SEC. They ultimately found a willing partner in Orlando, the person, not the city, a financier in Miami, the city, who had recently launched a SPAC, Benissari Capital Acquisition, with $100 million in its coffers. Perfect, right? Hi, it's me, David Waldman, the same guy who was just talking to you a second ago. Our Patreon subscription drive is still going strong, with over 175 monthly donors who help keep us on the air. If we've helped keep you going during the pandemic, why not return the favor and help us keep going so we can all be together for the next disaster? Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it easy to make secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. Maybe you'd like to thank us for keeping you sane during the Trump era. Maybe you're looking forward to in-depth explanations of what's going on in the Biden administration. Whatever it is that keeps you listening, we need your help to keep bringing it to you. And hey, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running with those options too. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We literally could not do this without you. All right, welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Networks Radio. I'm going to continue on with this story. It's a very long one, and I could have saved this thing for Friday or the next Monday. Would have made great pre recorded shows, great answer doing those one topic shows. But this seemed really, I don't know, it's not super important, and it's not the thing that's going to, um, uh, you know, be the next step in the downfall of Donald Trump since nothing will anyway. But it is very interesting and just very telling, I think. So. I, I love the story just in terms of uh, illustrating the dangers of doing anything with Donald Trump, even getting into a partnership with him where you're giving away money hand over fist. You're just handing him cash is not enough. He just says, I understand that there's more cash and I'd like you to hand that one over to me, too. And, uh, you know, I just don't know why anybody will never learn their lesson, but. All you can do is tell the stories and hope that someone else hears it and uh, under, comes to understand that you can't do any more business with them. It won't happen on this show, though. So in that sense, perhaps a waste, perhaps a waste of time. Anyway, so uh, no banks would do any business with him. Uh, they told him a fairy tale. They told him what he wanted to hear, Wilkerson, with respect to why that was the case, I think. I mean, really, no investment banker is going to get involved in a deal where 90% of the equity is already gone. And the people who are really doing the work behind forming the company, if, if, the, if you can even call it that, but the people who are doing the, the legwork, at least of, of, of talking to investment bankers and going through the embarrassment of begging for their money, are the owners of the other 10%, then they're just not going to give that up. That's their payment for having to, you know, do this embarrassing prostration before investment bankers begging for cash. So they let him down easy and said, well, it's a January 6th thing. And who knows? Maybe they even said to them, well, in time, if that passes, you can come back. But in the meantime, you actually need to launch this thing. You're going to have to find some other source of money. They go, they find Patrick Orlando, a financier in Miami who had recently launched a SPAC called Benissari Capital Acquisition that had $100 million in its coffers. Who's Benissari? Or what does it mean? I don't know. It's kind of unexplained. There's a link here to, you know, from the name. What does it lead to? An SEC filing about them. So not something I'm going to thumb through at the moment, but it's a little weird. And it doesn't matter in the end because you say Benissari Capital Acquisition. I thought it was Digital World Acquisition. Well, that comes later. First, they try with Benissari. In late February, Orlando 
Wilkerson and other Trump allies outlined the vision for Trump in a Mar-a-Lago dining hall, taking photos to remember the moment. We viewed ourselves at the time as the Avengers. That's where that title of the section comes from, I guess. Why the Avengers? I don't know. They had just seen the Avengers on TV, so they regarded themselves that way. We were an unstoppable force, but guess what happened? They got stopped. Now, next section is up, and it says, its title is, DJT is pissed. Can you guess who DJT is? And he's always pissed. Speaking of piss, he looks like he drinks his own because, I don't know, it's turned his hair that color. I suppose that could be a side effect. There's no medical reason for believing that whatsoever, just to be clear. But really also, no really good reason for drinking the urine either. So just don't do it. The next several months were a frantic rush to meet with potential partners hire workers, and build the business, Wilkerson said. In other words, it's another one of those situations where you're like, I I love how they build their business from the opposite direction, as opposed to like, well, I wanted to see whether there was really a market for this, and did we have a product? Let's create a product and then try to sell it. Let's instead sell shares in the company and then try and use that money to go make a company to come up with a product or something. We'll hire some people who might have ideas about what, what to make. All right, that's the way big shots run businesses these days. And I guess it's true in some cases, just not these guys. So the next several months were a frantic rush to meet with potential partners, hire workers, and build the business, Wilkerson said. The daily logbook shows the men flying to meetings with conservative media figures and exchanging proposals at bars, golf clubhouses, and pizza joints. It's good work if you can get it. In other words, you ask some rich guys to give up some of their money in supposedly either in the hopes of making more money or more likely in the case of Patrick Orlando, the idea of uh, pleasing Donald Trump by handing over some portion of that $100 million to him in exchange for God knows what later on. But in the meantime, it's good work for these guys. Wilkerson, who has no product, no company, no structure, no nothing, has a pot of money and he's allowed to use it to fly around the country and hang out in bars, golf clubhouses, and pizza joints with other conservatives and ask them for more money. And if he gets it, great. And if he doesn't get it, the flight and the pizza and the golf is paid for out of the pot of money that comes from other, some other dummy, just not me. The team, Wilkerson said, also gave Trump regular in-person updates at Pervalago, Trump Tower, and his golf club in Bedminster Township, New Jersey. But as the company became more legitimate, meh, it also started running into problems. And isn't it funny how problems come with legitimacy? If you don't actually have a product or anything and you start to become legitimate, whatever that's supposed to mean, uh, problems arise. Trump's umbrella company, the Trump Organization, disputed a long-signed agreement between the startup and Trump himself, demanding more control over how Trump's likeness would be used, Wilkerson said. And Trump's adult sons, quote unquote, I would say adult sons, Donald Jr. and Eric began asking for large stakes in the company, Wilkerson said, even though they had been almost entirely uninvolved. And that's actually the least surprising part about it, that they'd been uninvolved. But interesting that they I start asking for large stakes in the company. His dad owns 90%, but they also want 90%. And me too. And who cares whether that's uh, 270%? That's what we want. All right, sure. Representatives for the Trump family business did not respond to requests for comment. They were coming in and asking for a handout. Wilkerson said, and as you know, Republicans don't do that, right? They had no bearing in this company and they were taking equity away from hardworking individuals. The hard work, of course, being flying around to pizza places and golf clubs around the country asking for more money. That's panhandling, but from a private jet. Orlando brought his own issues. In June of 2021, he'd raised tensions when he sent Trump a birthday letter in which he devoted hundreds of words to Trump's, quote, thought leadership and, quote, quick and genius guidance during a recent meeting discussing the company's name and logo. In other words, the decoration of the company. I want it to have gold curtains and it should have Trump. What are we making here? 
media, Trump media, social. Some people say social, some people say social media. It could say either one, as far as I'm concerned. But the big part should say Trump. What again? Trump social media. And uh, there should be a picture of me, Trump. And it should be huge. And that's what he wanted to have a meeting over. And so... As a result of that fabulous meeting, you know, how do we build this technology? What are we going to do with our servers? Who's going to code this thing? And how's it going to work? And do we have the server capacity? And uh, how many people are we going to need to monitor this, that, or the other thing? I want the curtains. The curtains should also say Trump. In fact, they want you to spell out Trump in curtains. I don't know. Do whatever you have to do. Make sure that happens. This is the advice he's getting. And so Orlando writes him a letter. You're a genius. Your guidance was fantastic. The obsequiousness of the letter apparently upsets his partners. It goes on. Here's some quotes. I was unaware of the extent of your brilliance, Orlando had written. On your birthday, dear leader, on your birthday, my only wish is that you realize how proud we are of your success to date. The letter agitated the co-founders, Wilkerson said, who found it mawkish and overly familiar, which is saying something. Moss and Latinsky were further unnerved when Orlando routed roughly $8 million into Trump media via an unknown group called the ES Family Trust. I don't know who that is. You don't know who that is. Nobody knows who that is. Doesn't sound good. I have no guesses as to who ES is. But also then refused to say where it had come from besides ES Family Trust. Wilkerson said, so $8 million comes in. Obviously, some equity needs to go out the door for that. But to who and how much and in what ratio? We don't know. Their previous investments had come from people they knew, but this money appeared to have been routed from a bank in the Caribbean island of Dominica, which I learned to pronounce last time it came up, and I said Dominica, not like Dominican Republican, but Dominica, which, yes, is where Paolo Zampoli has his passport mill. Everyone will remember that. Uh, and just to make it even more shady, it also came through a cryptocurrency company according to a wire transfer and financial documents from the transaction that Wilkerson shared with the Post and the SEC. Digital World, who the SPAC that actually did go through with the, or attempted to go through with the merger, Digital World and Orlando did not respond to requests for information about the transaction or other reporting in this article. When Orlando had first gotten involved, he'd suggested merging Trump media with Benacere, right? The already public SPAC. But Orlando also began suggesting a second option, Wilkerson said, one of Orlando's newer SPACs, Digital World that had yet to be launched, but could raise much more money. I don't know how you know that. They just say it. In his complaint to the SEC, Wilkerson said the original SPAC, quote, could not sufficiently capitalize Trump media at a valuation that was acceptable to Trump and the company's leaders, and that it would also result in Orlando making less money compared to substituting Orlando's future SPAC. So, there's all the motivation you need to change the deal. Benissari is out. Digital World is in. Digital World's registration form filed with the SEC in May of 2021 and signed by Orlando said the SPAC and its representatives had not initiated any substantive discussions directly or indirectly with any business combination target. But in Wilkerson's complaint, he claims that Digital World and Trump Media had substantive communications regarding a merger that he alleged violated SEC rules. They said they hadn't had any discussions. They actually had violation enough all by itself. Not to mention, he says, apparently it violates other SEC rules for them to do it, not just to misrepresent the nature of the conversation. On April 14th, I guess they misrepresented the nature of the conversation because they were aware that they had already violated SEC rules and wanted to avoid admitting that. So they violated another SEC rule by lying about the extent of their conversations. On April 14th, 2021, Moss and Latinsky learned in a meeting with Orlando that the Benissari deal was no longer viable, but the digital world could be an option. 
Wilkerson said. An entry in the computer log notes that day as uh, notes day that, quote, the Bene deal is off, all caps off and four exclamation points. I don't know why that's so exciting to them. After leaving the meeting, Wilkerson said the meeting, the men were so stunned by the suggestion of something they believed to be improper that they wondered whether it was a government setup or if Orlando had been wearing a secret recording device. The log quotes Latinsky in calling it the roughest day so far and says, Patrick, that's Orlando, pitches us plan B. I get scared. Is he wearing a wire? (laughs) These guys are really already that suspicious. The men arranged a brief follow-up meeting with Orlando shortly after, this time to record their conversation with him, during which they stated their concerns. We can only engage in discussions after they're public. That's the rule, Latinsky can be heard saying in the recording, a copy of which Wilkerson shared with the Post and the SEC. Orlando responded, that's exactly the rules we have to play by. He then added, we have to be very smart. Obviously, we can't talk hypothetically about if there were another vehicle, at which point Latinsky cuts him off. Later, Orlando says, we'll make some magic happen. The men exchanged some more pleasantries before parting ways. Why be pleasant at this point? I don't know. Three months later, in late July, an entry in the log said Moss eventually talked to, quote, DJT on the phone to discuss potential plan B, unquote. So now they're making the switch to digital world. The Post asked three SPAC experts about whether a SPAC's leadership knowing its target merger partner and not disclosing it before filing its initial public offering document form known as form S one would violate sec rules. Uh, the answer is yes. John Coates, a former acting director of the sec's corporate finance division told the post, if the identity of a merger partner is known before a form S one is filed and goes effective, it must be disclosed whether it's a SPAC or not. For a SPAC, a known merger partner is even more obviously material to investors, right? You can't sell shares in a SPAC and say, we don't know what we're going to acquire, but you have to trust us that we're going to acquire something great. How much do you want to pay per share to get in on the ground floor? Uh, if you already, in fact, know the merger target and you have inside information about who you're going to merge with and all your investors are kept in the dark, that's not going to fly. Michael Klausner, a Stanford University law professor, said it would violate SEC regulations and argued that a failure to disclose the SPAC's plans would be an end around the IP, uh, the IPO rules. Michael or, hmm, or, 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 I don't know how you even pronounce this. O H L R O G G E. I guess Orogi is probably as close to anything. Orogi. Uh, at any rate, a New York University law professor, so if you're at NYU, you, you can call in and correct this, said the failure to tell investors could violate the SEC's rules against material misstatements and omissions, but that there can be gray areas in instances where a sponsor runs multiple SPACs, like Orlando, and targets a company with one SPAC after having seriously considered it with another. Sounds like he might have known that loophole. For example, in one instance involving a maritime shipping company, he said, the SEC halted its review of the SPAC's filings, but eventually allowed the merger to proceed. Doesn't really tell us too much, but okay. Digital World held its initial public offering in September of 2021 and announced its plan to merge with Trump Media one month later. The SPAC ultimately raised roughly $300 million, not including a separate $1 billion bundle known as a Private Investment in Public Equity, or PIPE, P-I-P-E, Private Investment Public Equity. Never really ran into that one before. From an unidentified group of investors set to pay out once the merger is complete. Sounds not at all shady, right? In one video Wilkerson shared from October 2021, Orlando can be seen standing in the Trump media office toasting with a large bottle of Vue Clicquot champagne. I really want to build a $100 billion company. Hey, me too. I think this is the team to do it, he said. Andy and Wes and the entire team, I'm so happy to be working with you guys. We're going to see a lot of each other for decades to come. 
possibly in prison. The log cites daily notes of Moss, Latinsky, and Wilkerson strategizing how to handle the Trump family's growing interest in the business's rising fortunes. One person advised them, for instance, that Trump Jr., quote, needs a bedtime story and some love, an entry shows. That is, he's demanding money. The timeline entries also show the men growing accustomed to dealing with Trump's sudden reversals and rage because he's mentally stable, right? On September 23rd, 2021, the log records cite Latinsky saying, President Trump calls me in mourning to yell at me because Don Jr. is upset. The next day, Don Jr. calls Wes and yells at him. On October 12th, DJT calls in crazy mood and he tries to renegotiate the entire deal. Don Jr. walks in room and wants to get paid. On October 30th, DJT is pissed. Tensions also began to grow inside the company over who was in control. Latinsky, Moss, and Wilkerson, eager to hire a point person to handle financial marketing and public scrutiny, had in November gotten dinner at an Atlanta steakhouse with then-Representative Nunes. Why is he in Atlanta? I don't know. Uh, Nunes, of course, a Trump loyalist and prominent Republican critic of Silicon Valley. Two months later, Nunes resigned from Congress to become the company's CEO with Trump and the co-founders' support. Company filings show Nunez is paid a base salary of $750,000 a year that could increase to $1 million in the second year, plus bonuses and equity. He had no prior experience leading a tech company, and there was no equity to give him either. Wilkerson had expressed sharply critical views of Nunez's leadership of the company. He told the Post that in Nunez's first days at the office, Nunez began exhorting workers to come in early and stay late and berating company officials over what he saw as flawed decision making. Wilkinson or Wilkerson added that he believed this fueled acrimony among the company's more established employees. He began bringing in a camp of people who were Nunez loyalists, Wilkerson said, to the point where it became very fractious and hampered our ability to be productive, which was initially hampered anyway by the fact that you guys had never done anything. A small team of developers raced to build Truth Social from the company's We Work office floor in Atlanta. That's why they were there, Wilkerson said. In February, shortly before it opened to the public, Wilkerson published the first post, or truth, to Trump's profile. Quote, get ready. Your favorite president will see you soon. In a video he shared with the Post, Wilkerson can be shown hitting the button and saying, history has been made, and it really hasn't. But days later, the site had an embarrassing launch, including a 13-hour outage and an overwhelming waiting list for new accounts. Wilkerson said many of the issues had been the fault of third-party vendors, including the video site Rumble, which he said had been delayed in preparing server hardware for the site's debut. Rumble spokesman Brian Doherty denied his company bore any responsibility for Truth Social's difficult launch. Truth Social, he said, has run fully off Rambles, Rumble's servers since April, and the company looks forward to continuing to support Trump media. In March, Wilkinson said the company underwent a major shakeup. The board of directors, once composed of Trump, Latinsky, and Moss, dropped Latinsky and added Nunes. Trump Jr. and former Nunez aide Kash Patel. Within days, the company's chiefs of technology, product development, and legal affairs resigned. Wilkerson said he remembers some other employees tearfully processing the sudden upheaval. It was such a violent removal of the founders of this thing, he said. It was a very jarring experience, and it set this company on a path where it may not be able to be redeemed. Very interesting, by the way. Also, uh, looking back on the uh, the guy from Rumble saying, it's not our fault. This is kind of a weird statement. It's not our fault. It's their fault. Uh, adding that uh, um, they have 
uh, run Truth Social off of Rumble's servers since April. So actually that makes it sound like maybe it was Rumble's fault after all. I don't know how that was supposed to be exonerating. All right. What value does the company have is the next section here. Maybe we can fit it in before we make our exit for the day. Truth Social's website has stabilized and Trump has taken to using it as his primary online megaphone. But the site's audience remains tiny compared with major social networks. And unlike its original proposal, promising a big tent for all kinds of political thought, it has been criticized for featuring largely pro-Trump comments and memes. Elon Musk back in our news again, huh? Twitter's, it says, likely next owner, uh, many of you disagree, I have seen that in our KITM hashtag, and the world's richest man, by the way, told the Financial Times last week that Truth Social is a right-wing echo chamber that might as well be called Trumpet, which is probably a pretty good name for it, actually, now that you think about it, or I think about it. Anyway, yes, I do at least, I have seen at least one explicit comment uh, from this morning's discussion of Elon Musk, from Asparagus Zucchini, who also shared this article with us, by the way, saying Elon Musk is not buying Twitter. He will end up paying the $1 billion cancellation fee after 10 years of lawsuits. He doesn't have the funds, even though he's the world's richest man. But, you know, whatever. The digital world's merger freeze, that is the SPAC, right? The merger freeze has also thrown the company's future into doubt. The company originally promised to close that merger by last month, but Orlando has since begun asking shareholders to vote to push back the deadline in hopes of resolving the federal investigations and sealing the deal. Digital World, with help from its sponsor, Arc Capital, another financial entity somehow enters into this. They're an investment firm based in Shanghai, which is totally in this country and so therefore perfectly safe, has paid roughly $3 million to give itself until December 8th to finish the merger. The company has delayed shareholder meetings three times, including earlier this week, last week, without announcing whether it has received approval for an extension from the required 65% of the shareholders. The company has warned that a failed vote could force it to liquidate without Trump media pocketing any of the money it had raised. And that scares Donald Trump more than anything, I'm sure. In an SEC filing last month, Digital World said investors had sent termination notices between September 19th and 23rd, pulling out roughly $138 million from the pipe, the right private investment in public equity. The company, which has submitted SEC filings suggesting it has quote, enough operating capital to last, quote, until at least next spring, recently changed its headquarters address from an office in Miami's upscale Brickell Financial District to a mailbox in a UPS store in the Miami neighborhood of Coconut Grove. Okay, so some downsizing of the office space. Truth Social's hallmark, Trump's involvement has been undermined by the possibility that a Musk-owned Twitter could restore Trump's account. Trump has insisted he would not rejoin Twitter, even if he is reinstated, though some Trump advisors told the Post they think he wouldn't be able to resist. Trump has also undermined confidence in the deal, saying in a Truth Social post last month that he may just end up skipping out on the SPAC deal and taking the venture private because he's, quote, really rich. Now, if he takes his bat and his ball and goes home, what value does the company have at that point, Wilkerson said. Wilkerson said he hopes that by speaking out, he will help protect the company's shareholders from possible harm. His attorneys said the information he has shared should shield him as a protected whistleblower from company retaliation, and they have questioned the terms of Trump's meet of Trump Media's non-disclosure agreement. It's drafted to silence him to prevent him from talking and to punish him if he does so, his attorney, Phil Brewster, said. That's actually the conclusion of the article. Yeah, the non-disclosure agreement is, in fact, drafted to silence him. That's, generally speaking, what most of them are about, but certainly Trump's have historically been about. But, uh, well, very interesting, to say the very least. And, of course, another example of how everything Trump touches dies. And uh, an amazing insight into his boundless greed. Having been gifted 90% of the shares in this company, he actually 
wants some for Melania, but it has to come out of other people's pockets. The two adult sons come sniffing around looking for an equity handout as well. And uh, how about this guy running the SPACs and switching SPACs midstream because he'll have the opportunity to make more money somehow out of uh, the deal if he matches them up with one that hasn't yet gone public. But in order to do that, he has to lie about whether or not he has an acquisition target. So the whole thing starts off on the wrong foot entirely with the SEC. Doesn't look good there. And I think it's only going to end up feeding the New York AG's lawsuit. You know, this is behavior, this fraudulent behavior about overstating the value of assets and and, uh, et cetera, et cetera, is uh, only demonstrative of a continuing pattern. He's still trying to pull this fraud with banks and investment bankers and private equity companies. It doesn't look good for him. But uh, in the meantime, I guess... Even at $18 a share, he owns 90% of the whole company and he never put any of his own money into it. So maybe he's not too upset. Plus, of course, he'll just overstate the value of his shares anyway, even though everyone can see that it's only $18 a share. There's a a Trump brand premium. If you buy shares from me, they're not just any shares. They're the shares that came from Donald Trump himself. I'll get a premium for all of that. Who knows? Anyway, we'll be back tomorrow. Joan McCarter scheduled to be with us, of course, and we'll bring you up to speed on what's happening in Congress as well as around this crazy world. From NetworksRadio.com. This crazy world. You have been listening to k in the Morning with David Waldman. Well, now's your chance to stop listening to k in the Morning with David Waldman and start listening to the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Justice Putnam. He's got plenty on these stories and many more. And, uh, well, we'll give you a hint of what's coming up. Oh, you know what? Let's keep it a surprise as I hear the music winding down. I planned this from the beginning. Stay tuned.